on forgiveness and higher consciousness with Anna Holub on the Enlightened Society podcast. This is the first in a series of interviews to follow. They were conducted at the conference Exploring Psychedelics in Culture, Religion, and Science. I'd like to thank the conference organizer, Dr. Martin W. Ball, Professor of Religious Studies, for being so gracious in facilitating these interviews. Martin is a leader in the exploration and mapping of human consciousness. Please check out his books and his podcast, Entheogenic Evolution, at martinball.net. There are very few communities that are directly interested in consciousness. The closest include the Buddhist, academic, and psychedelic communities, and to some extent the self-help, artistic, and environmental movements, among a few others. Each has its focus and unique benefits. Together, they form the foundation for the human potential movement. New Media Productions and Enlightened Society Podcast in particular were started in response to the lack of content about consciousness itself. This content is not based on any particular tool or tradition. Rather, the mission is to understand consciousness, discover reality, and experience meaning. To explore the disparate oceans, and to be a bridge among them. This series of interviews, along with some of the previous episodes, exemplifies the value that exists within these rich traditions. We only briefly discuss psychedelics themselves, but they provided a lens through which to focus on the integration after a unity experience, what it means to be a conscious human being, and how to live in this world. Anna Holub is a peace educator, forgiveness counselor, and recovery coach. Her academic backgrounds include peace studies and dispute resolution. Her books are Forgive and Be Free, A Step-by-Step Guide to Release, Healing, and Higher Consciousness, and The Edges Are Friendly. She also has a new online course, Forgive and Be Free of Your Addictions. She has worked with inmates, teens, and hospice patients with their families. Find more at AnnaHolub.com. Let's start with the basics. What is forgiveness in relation to what is not forgiveness? We normally, and I find this is cross-cultural, we think of forgiveness in a certain way, and I call that the traditional method, or the, the traditional model of forgiveness, which is a lot about letting go of a slight or a crime that happened. It could be a large one, it could be a small one, but something happened to us that puts us into a victim role. Somebody else did something, we didn't like it, we got angry or upset in some way, and then sometimes we wait for an apology. And sometimes people say, well, you know, when I get an apology, then I'll forgive, meaning then I'll let it go. Um, There's a problem with that, though, because if we wait for an apology, we might not get one. And if we get one, we might not like it. Or maybe the person is dead, or the person is not available, or the person is waiting for us to give them an apology. So waiting around for an apology in order to forgive is not a good idea. And the forgiveness itself, what does that mean? Normally, when we learn about that this as children, we learn, oh, well, okay, I'm supposed to let it go. I'm supposed to just not care about it, or I'm supposed to let time heal it. Or there's this idea of forgiving and forgetting. If I can just forget about it, then it'll all go away. And sometimes people do really have a a very powerful experience of, of letting go of their anger and recrimination and grievance and having a sense of peace, which is really what we're after. And why I do this, because I'm a peace activist. And the way in which I do my peace activism is through teaching this method of forgiveness. The method I use is what I call an expanded model, so that we get away from doing like a tit-for-tat 
kind of thing. Well, you know, if they come to me, then I'll forgive them, or maybe they're not available, but I'll forgive them for that particular thing. In my mind, what I find even more healing is to bring forgiveness into a larger context where I and we learn to walk through life letting go of our suffering. So it becomes more of a laying down of burdens. And how do we do that? In order to become clear channels and unwind all this constriction that most of us have around past trauma, past pain. Some of it is stuff that is old through our family. Some of it is personal that have happened in our lives. Some of it is social and cultural. And some of it is simply what's happening on the planet. There's so many levels to which we could lay down the burden of pain around what we experience in this life. So we need to learn how to do that. We need to realize why we would want to do that. But one of the fears that comes up is that, oh, if I do that, then I'll become a doormat. I'll be weak. And therefore, the marauding hordes can come and attack me. Uh, and that's just really ancient in our human psyche. So part of the message I have is, no, that's actually not true. If we do this inner work of laying down our sadness and our fears and our pain and our past memory, we actually become stronger. We actually become more connected to our intuition, our spiritual intelligence, and we become more determined and more available to be in service. So that's why we would want to do this in the first place. Plus, the more we uh, heal these places of pain inside of ourselves, the more joy we get, the more fun life becomes, the less bogged down and irritated we are, and then the more talents that maybe we didn't even know we had can start bubbling up. And it's a big doorway into creativity. So for all those reasons, as I have experienced myself in my life, I use this stuff personally, and I continue to. And then I also teach it to other people. The feeling of being weak is universal. Can you talk more about that feeling? Right. I do feel like that's a universal part of being human that we grapple with all around the world. Being weak, as far as I have seen, can show up differently depending on our social and cultural conditioning. A lot of it for me, I've worked with a lot of men. I worked in San Quentin prison for years with men and me, like 30 guys, inmates, violent men, and me being the only woman in the room. And I learned a lot about male social conditioning and what makes a man become violent. And I realized that being weak is one of the most illegal hated feelings to a macho mind, right? Now, women don't really have that same conditioning. And women, on the other hand, can kind of collapse into this overly emotional, histrionic, sort of crazy-making state where they feel very weak and very frustrated and very angry about it. So if we're afraid of weakness or we've spiraled down into a feeling of weakness, be we men or women or in between, we're not going to like it. It's not a fun place to be. And weakness itself, I feel, is a way in which <clears throat> some of these constrictions are letting us know they're there. If we don't feel in our full power, well, why not? A lot of times it has to do with trauma history. Um, and even more than that, it has to do with our spiritual connection. And a lot of times as kids, I know for me anyway, I had this 
deep spiritual connection. I didn't have words to put to it. I didn't have a family that was into that. Uh, my family is basically an atheist family. But yet I had this feeling inside of me of a certain kind of connection. But then as I became a teenager, or even before that, I kind of lost it for a while. And then I had to reclaim it later on. And I think a lot of us go through that. And while we're not in touch with our spiritual beauty and our glory of the light that we are, then it makes sense that we would feel weak. One of the problems is the male role belief system, as I have learned to call it, you know, the conditioning of what men go through in the patriarchy is that weakness is so uh, toxic in their mind, in the mind of that mindset, that violence comes out of proving, oh no, I'm not weak. In fact, I need to be top dog. In fact, I got to have a fight over who's top dog because neither of us want to be seen as weak. So this whole question about weakness is, is good, and I'm glad you're asking it. Not many people do ask me about that. But really, if we're not feeling in our full connection, then we will feel weak and we will feel miserable, whether we try to hide it or we show it to the world. Can you talk about the feeling of strength that you feel through forgiveness? Yes. The strength that I continue to open into is not the hard, tough strength that we've been taught, oh, this is what strength is about. It's a compassionate, soft, patient strength that isn't going anywhere. So for some people, they might call it the Divine Mother or Divine Feminine. Um, I don't always use those words, but yet there is a quality of nurturing about it. And it's so deep and so kind that our, this kind of strength comes from love. It doesn't come from protection, and it doesn't come from might or control over someone else. So as a society, we're all unwinding this sadness and pain and violence that comes from it. And learning about this different kind of strength, which is it has a softness, but it has a determination to it that um, we can call upon to help us. So that part is really exciting to me. Um, I also feel like for me personally and how I do this work, I have support. I have spiritual support. And I like to sometimes talk about that. I'm feeling like I need to talk about that now, having to do with this soft strength, which is that I feel like one of, not one of, the strongest guide that I have is the, the essence of who we know of as Jesus. I am not a religious Christian. I have a Jewish background. I have a personal connection to this being called Jesus who teaches me about this soft kind of strength. He's no pushover. <laughs> In fact, he's the wisest being I've ever come across, which is why I gladly let him guide the forgiveness work. And I know that he's working with many, many people all over the planet and has for a long time. So. I haven't really talked about that so much, but in recent, like in the last year or two, I felt like it's really important to, to name my mentors and to give thanks and to let Jesus out of the bag. Sometimes people just immediately turn away, and I hope anybody who's listening will give me a chance here that I'm not talking about the religious experience that you had as a child. Because I actually was freed from that because I didn't grow up as a Christian. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Christianity. In fact, Christianity is wonderful when it's actually practiced. 
So when I meet a true Christian who really loves the peacemaking and love vibe of what I find is healing, then we're on the same page and we're in the same classroom together. I like to think of Jesus as a turning point in human history. That's not entirely accurate, but around 2,000 years ago, we see pushback against empire, against domination, against power. We see the rise of the idea of human rights, of freedom. Do you have any thoughts about that? I do, actually, because that is something that a lot of people hold, that before Jesus, nothing was happening. And Jesus came out of a very deep and wise tradition of Judaism. So I don't want to uh, forget about Jesus' tradition, where he came from, that there is one essence. Call it God, if you will. Call it whatever you want, but there's one loving kind essence and being reverent about that is part of the tradition that Jesus came out of that's very very rich and very very deep through Judaism I feel like what he added to it was this experience and and transmission of love Overall, over everything else, the main thing that we need to focus on and concentrate on is divine love. That wasn't missing from Judaism, but Judaism had gotten a little bogged down in all the rules. The rules were excellent coming out of, say, a a pretty chaotic earlier epic. Uh, So then Jesus came along and expanded, I feel, the message, even more so. He did it as a Jew. There was no Christianity at the time. So when I tune into him, I tune into him as as part of my tribe. And I also tune into the, the whole tribe of everyone on earth and anyone who wants to be part of it, this love tribe, please, please be part of it. You talked about Jesus as a mentor. Can you talk about other people who have influenced you? Sure. Before I do that, I just want to mention, too, that the way in which Jesus became a mentor for me is through a, a spiritual book that he wrote called A Course in Miracles. So I've been studying Course in Miracles for the past, say, 15 years or so. And it's his voice as transcribed through um, a woman who is no longer in a body anymore, named Helen Shuckman, and another man who helped her, named Bill Thetford, and the two of them brought through this incredible wisdom, which is Jesus' teaching for our current age. So when I got a hold of that, that's when I started tuning into Jesus as a teacher. So I encourage people to just check it out. It's not for everybody, I understand that, but it's really, really deep and really beautiful teachings. So some of my other mentors, one is a man named Colin Tipping. He wrote a book called Radical Forgiveness. He's written other books uh, since then, and he was a definite mentor for me, and he still is in his own beautiful way, because he opened the possibility for me and many people that he's trained that this forgiveness work can be an actual viable path, and that it's complementary to a lot of other paths. You don't have to stop doing anything else, but you can add this understanding about the depth of this expanded model of forgiveness, where there's a learning component in it. Not just, oh, I forgive that other person, end of story, they did something horrible to me, end of story, I'm going to forgive them now, I don't really know how I'm going to do it. That's the traditional model, but in the expanded model, we say, well, what is this doing in my life? What happened, and what are these patterns that keep going, and this is my cycle of pain? So what am I going to do about it? And it really makes us be a lot more 
responsible, but we're not responsible only as an individual unit because if I try to fix myself, so to, so to speak, in order to be healed and I don't reach to my spiritual essence of who I am, I won't, I won't, it won't work. So as an individual, there's only so far we can get. That's the trouble that I have with psychology as it is often uh, offered. People get very, very um, clear on what their issues are, but they don't necessarily experience a deep healing. So sometimes people come to me and they say, oh my God, I've had so much therapy. I know all about my issues and I'm just running around in circles. So that's the time in which adding this healing that is well beyond a personality, it's beyond any one person, but we reach into the collective beauty that we are, the, the light that we are, and we ask humbly for support and healing, that's when the Holy Spirit comes. And Jesus talks a lot about the Holy Spirit in A Course in Miracles. The way I describe it is it's, it's, the, it's the highest light that we can imagine and beyond. So whatever name you want to call it, that's, that's fine and dandy. It's just reaching for the purity of the light that we are for help and asking for help and then being able to let go and lay down these sorrows and these fears, offering them the giveaway, giving them away to spirit, and then receiving light and love and direction and guidance in their place. It takes a lot of willingness and trust to do that. And getting back to my mentors, Colin Tipping was very instrumental in me healing a lot of my personal stuff that I worked with him. And then he trained me as a radical forgiveness coach. And then later on, I started adding in some other flavors that were particular to me, but it's, it's complementary to what he does. I, I find that I am softer and more devotional in my approach yet it's it's still all the same universal truth coming out. Each person has their own direct experience of what that is, and, and we run out of words. We run out of ways to describe it. And if you're listening right now and you've never had that experience, it is available. I want to let you know that it's not for special people. It's for everyone. It's part of our true nature of who we are. And what I've discovered is that all we need to do is take off the layers. We don't have to add anything. We don't have to fix ourselves. We don't have to become a better person. We don't have to decide, oh, I've screwed up and now I'm going to do something and make myself better. Really, all we need to do is take off the layers of shame and guilt and fear. We have to go find them and be willing to sit with them and breathe with them and give them space to teach us and then let them go lay them down. Um, then I call it doing the striptease. You know, it's layer after layer, veil after veil, drop it to the ground, it turns into dust. There's nothing there. We think it is. We think it's really real when we're looping it in our minds over and over again. This is a way to stop looping and make an offering to the divine and then receive the blessings and some guidance about, oh my gosh, how can I learn about what just happened? Oh, I came here. I'm bigger than just this personality. Who I am is an eternal being of light. I'm only here temporarily. I'm only having this Anna experience for me personally, very temporarily. So what's all this doing in my life? Well, it's part of my awakening. And I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm doing it on behalf of all beings. So when I remember that and I help people to realize that, then we can have the courage to drop into some of those places that we haven't wanted to visit. And that's where addiction starts to drop away. 
And it takes a lot of trust and it takes a lot of courage. And that's why we sit with each other. That's why I sit with people every day on the phone or on Skype or in person and hold the trust and help guide the process until such time as the people that I work with, they can learn it for themselves. And then they don't need me. They don't need to come back time after time after time. Yeah, we need to practice it and may need to come a few times. But the ultimate goal is when you wake up at three in the morning and your heart is pounding, you've got some anxiety going on, you can say, oh, wait a minute. I don't have to do this for hours. I can use this unlayering and get myself into a prayerful, sacred space, offer all this to unity consciousness or the source or nature or whatever name we put on it that makes sense to us, and then receive the blessings. Receiving blessings is a whole stretch in and of itself. We haven't really been taught very well how to do that. So that's also part of this work. So forgiveness can be thought of as a tool for higher consciousness. Is that right? Yes. This is why I'm passionate about it. I see forgiveness as being a doorway that every single one of us has to walk through if we want to really experience directly, mystically, our own divine essence. We can't go to heaven hauling all this crap with us. We have to let it go so that we can walk through the doorway and get to the good stuff, you know, which is peace and love and our creativity and also our purpose to have some kind of meaning of what we're doing here. And I find that a lot of people get stuck because they don't know how to unwind the sadness and the pain. So I help people to do that until they can understand how to do it on their own. And there's just so much in this world that says to us, oh, well, take this pill, you know, take this antidepressant or just watch a bunch of TV and forget about it and have a drink of beer and just don't go to, don't go very deep because a lot of our relationships are about not going very deep, but there's a lot of sadness over that. We miss each other. We need each other. We need to be awake and um, alive and real with each other. And I feel like there's an incredible craving for that right now. And this kind of inner work really helps us to walk through the door and then be in our divine essence together. We've been talking with Anna Holub. You can find more at AnnaHolub.com. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And that's A-N-A-H-O-L-U-B dot com. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's wonderful to meet you and to have this conversation.